Christian, thanks for joining me today to have a talk about memorizing verbatim, which I know you do quite frequently and have, you know, previous experience as well with uh, having done acting and whatnot. So, yes. how you been, first off? Thanks a lot. It's been great. Had a great time on the podcast uh, when was on here a while ago, and uh, it's just been a fun, magnetic uh, memory type of year since then. Uh, moving into 2019, so I think it's going to be fun to be doing more of this stuff where we can interact and share ideas and come up with more creative ways to uh, facilitate everybody's goals. Right, right. Yeah, well, again, I, I really appreciate it, and especially with respect to that initiative to speak to more uh, people who are using these techniques and in our community, and uh, it's, it's really great to uh, see some of the things that you've done and that you've shared and then turn it into the basis for some teaching-based conversation for people. So yes. maybe just start with like, what attracts you to memorizing verbatim texts like poems and, and w what I've seen you do. Uh, one of my inspirations is Orson Welles. He has a voluminous, he's had a, he had a voluminous memory for of Shakespeare and recitations and poetry and I've, uh, he's been a huge influence on me. So just having seen that, and I'm not, I've just started learning about Shakespeare. I mean, we've all studied Shakespeare, right. but I didn't necessarily have an ear for it or understand how it was working entirely until last year. I had some breakthroughs with that. So it's nice to be able to be inspired by those who've been doing it for a long time. And uh, Shakespearean actors are known for, you know, memorizing these gigantic texts so it's a, uh, you know, from that kind of a tradition that I've been excited about it. And being able to do toasts is something that's fun when we're celebrating with our friends and we're able to do like a memorized toast. That's also a very cool uh, idea that people don't use very often anymore. I mean, most often I, I don't hang out with people who've memorized large things. So I'm the guy who's actually doing the toasts, you know, which is why I've been putting focus into this direction. Right, right. Um, okay, so Shakespeare, toasts, and what about... Shakespeare, toast, poetry, and, you know, the living organism of the artistic soul. Right. That, <laughs> excuse me, is uh, so important, I think, as things become digitized and uh, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, really, but two-dimensional, and so we're punished with corporate you know, uh, merchandising and commercials and all of these things coming at us 24 hours a day. It's, it takes a lot of discipline to just turn things off for a while. I mean, it's insane the amount of discipline we have to use to just step away from the cell phone that's blinging and sending notifications or to not get lost down the rabbit hole of YouTube every day. These things are fun. They're exciting because of the fact we're still in the pioneer episode of learning all this stuff, but yeah. I think that it's also one of those things that uh, I, I feel I need some kind of a spiritual literary bath after I've gone down the rabbit hole for too long, or even watching family members go down the rabbit hole for too long. I feel like I have to isolate myself, put on nice music, put on, take out a like the Grapes of Wrath or, uh, <laughs> you know, um, Dostoevsky's uh, Notes from the Underground or something like that, Moby Dick. All of these things can wash over our artistic souls and kind of re renew us. Um, so that's kind of been the inspiration for being able to learn these things. There's one, one – in one way that we experience it, we listen to or watch or read the books or the literature – but on the other hand, if we were able to memorize that, we would be able to give it to others at any time right. in a connecting analog type of fashion. So that's kind of inspiring to me too. Right. Those are all really, really great points. And I would just note that it's very much part of this practice that when I go and memorize the verbatim stuff I'm working on, the digital devices, they're gone. And... Now I'm memorizing some things from the Isha Upanishad, uh, and I only found a very good transliteration online uh, to work with of the Sanskrit. And so what I do is, well, I've actually got it uh, right here, is uh, write it out 
on note paper and then go and memorize from the paper, not the screen. Even though it'd yes. be like super inconvenient to just like not deviate from the screen, it's uh, much better to go look at the page, vidyam cha, vidyam cha, you know, and start to work with it in the memory palace other than the screen, even though the best source I found is on the internet. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that you mention over and over again that's really uh, fundamental to learning any of these things. It, it's so true that if we write it down, it becomes something different. It goes through us. Uh, mm. What is it? Jack Kerouac says, straight from the mind to the voice with no hand intervening. So sometimes you're recording it and saying it and it's living. But, I mean, it's capturing, you know, your sounds and everything. Right. But at the same time, I think it's important that it goes through the hands. Things, it's just ridiculous. As I've been, the last few weeks, I've been memorizing larger amounts of material at a quicker pace. And I just made a rule that anything I'm going to learn at all. Like if it's four things, I'm going to get a four station mind palace. I'm going to get a notepad and write it out. And then I can throw the notes away. Right. I don't have to keep those notes. Not every paper has to be holy because it's supposed to become part of me in recitation. But at the same time, it's very uh, inspiring to be able to write it out. And when you're done, it's so simple. You write it out once, maybe you write it twice. And all of a sudden, it's starting to make a permanent impression inside of your you're, – you're seeing it. You're seeing the texture of the paper, the light on it, as well as the curves of the actual writing. It all comes to uh, fruition much quicker. Then I can move on to the next thing that I'm working on and review, go back and review too. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great point. And when you talk about creating your memory palaces, you've had some really interesting innovations on what it means to draw a memory palace. So – Maybe speak a little bit about some of that. So some of the memory palaces, you know, anything – we can basically think of a memory palace. Most people think of it as like your corner grocery store perhaps where you're the, or your corner store where you're there every day, which is a fantastic. Uh, as you say, dig the wells before you need them um, there. So uh, that's a fantastic resource. But if you look at it, dimensional experience is such that this is a mind palace. This is – well. Number one, you would go, what the heck is that thing? Yeah. It's, a, it's a Wonder Woman bracelet I got for, uh, you know, if I'm battling foes. Anyways, <laughs> it's made, and uh, uh, this is a good example of, well, that's just, it's a, it's a brass bangle, right? So it's in a C shape here. But once we have it in our hand, now it becomes a dimensional location-oriented place. Here's a door, here's a top, here's a bottom sides. So this is automatically able to be used for a mind palace. You're able to attach information on these different areas. I brought home the only thing I didn't take a picture of. I came up, I had a box that I came in co to contact with because I see all these boxes and things and go, oh, okay, this could be a mind palace because these are walls and it's just a little uh, shallow box. These are walls. And then if you flip it over, you can have things on there. So it's interesting to me to, to uh, reach with dimensions of, of the physical product. But I, I had a box that had a whole bunch of holes. It had 16 holes for bottles, small bottles to be put inside. Then it had flaps and it had the, the side areas. So all of a sudden it was very dimensionally complex. And I said, this would be an excellent experiment. And I brought it home and then I kicked it around for a few weeks. And I was like, okay, there's other things I have to work on that other than theoretical use of this garbage box. Um, I'm going to have to <laughs> get rid of this and, you know, use the idea, but let's move on because right now I don't have time to fully delve into the multi-dimensional box. Uh, but once you start thinking of anything like that, you're able to make use of it. And, and it's like uh, you were offering for my, my, when you, like you were offering for my beer studies of how you have the cylinder of the glass, the top, you have the pillar technique, as well as the cardinal point technique. Yeah. Because of that, you're able to uh, utilize all these different areas. I was not successful in entirely, you know, po you know, being able to utilize the cardinal point technique. Um, I start, but I was definitely uh, using the other, and and that's again all because of the fact that you have, you know, dimensions around you. This is a weird vase thing. It has multiple points here. Each of those points is a location where we could have information. So 
I think the big part about all of this isn't to sit and obsess on theoretical things we could use, but realize how it's all around us and just start to use them to accomplish our goals of what we want to memorize. Right. right. So starting to do uh, more of that as well. Very, very good. So that's a, um, that's a very, very interesting point of, you know, theory translated into action. When you think of a, a poem that you've memorized, what was that action like? What was the first thing and the second thing and the third thing? And So, yeah, here, we'll take a great example. Um, I just wrote a poem for in honor of David Amram mm. for his 88th birthday, and he's a beat composer. He wrote the uh, comp- he wrote the composition he composed. There we go. Let's right. learn English. He composed for the 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 Manchurian Candidate, the original movie in the nineteen sixties. Right. Uh, he wrote that composition. He also does some poetry, but he does live performances all over the world. And I wanted to do a tribute to him because he's been inspirational to me, and we've been in contact together. So I said I'm going to make a tribute to him for his birthday. So I wrote a poem. I wanted it to be of of some substantial length, meaning a couple pages, not just like a poem that was this big and said, hey, buddy, you know, I wanted it to be dense enough that someone could start to get bored by it if uh, by the end of it, if uh, if need be. So in writing that, I had to write it and which only took, you know, a day, maybe a few hours separated into different writing uh, situations. And then I had to memorize it. I was the deadline was his birthday, but I was only working on it the days preceding his birthday. So I knew I had to release it. So I knew I had to memorize it quickly as well. Right. So here we have to write the poem. Then it becomes something I'm more familiar with, uh, which is turning it into material. So in this situation for the chanting Amram uh, poem, what I did was a simple body list. And it's, again, one of those decisions I wouldn't have made if I had time. I, w- I would have maybe created something else because normally you're using a body list or as I was introduced to a body list was for a grocery store thing, erase and start over Mm. doing something as permanent as memorizing something that you've written and putting it on a body list, uh, assigning different lines and stanzas to places on your body, uh, using it like a loci technique. So I, I thought that would be a problem, but here's the beauty of this. uh, The the beauty of the whole situation is using it, eventually what happens is with repetition and with that recall rehearsal, the list starts to disappear when it starts to become part of your long-term memory. And it's not something I've heard many people talk about, but things that you repeat over and over and over again, they start off in a mind palace, but eventually that mind palace for me, starts to disappear, and the material is just this line leads into this line, leads into this line, leads into this line, and you're no longer thinking. Today I was repeating it in, in, in thinking of speaking with you about this topic. I was thinking of the fact that even now, it's been a few months since I memorized the piece, and I can vaguely recall where that line was. Like Right now, it's like a light impression of this, this stanza was on this shoulder, Maybe this was down here. Oh, I had more issues with this part, so it was on my you know, left knee or whatever. So it's one of those things that the ugly sister effect doesn't happen because – and maybe it would if I used this for another entire poem. But it seems to me like the body list is actually dissolving as it becomes part of my long-term memory here. And I've had this – I've done this with a, a toast that's a fairly long t- beer toast from the 1800s. Um, same type of thing where I memorized it in a mind palace and that was a couple of years ago. And now I can't even recall where the, what the mind palace was at all or how it was arranged because now the material just rolls through and it's its own, it's its own matter. Right. That's a really good point because a lot of people, they, their sticking point is that they don't want to use up a memory palace or they don't want to do it wrong in a memory palace and the reality is, is that the memory palace is ultimately irrelevant at the end of the day, once that you have the material and you can forget it, and you most likely will in some cases, um, and right. as, you, as you've talked about. Did you ever have a worry about that, uh, you know, getting it right uh, the first time or not burning up memory palaces, etc.? No, I've never really thought about that. But it brings up another point, which 
hearing you say that makes me think of something that I, cause I've, I think I've heard, you know, I don't want to use to it. And I, other people have said it before, or I've heard other people mention it on podcasts or whatever, but I think that it's one of those things that didn't relate to me. So therefore I just, uh, let it go and didn't think about it too much. Like you use up a mind palace. Oh, oh, oh. And I, I didn't really pay attention to it because it wasn't going to affect me. But now that you mention it, it, one of my core beliefs as a creator, as a, uh, yeah, as a c- content creator, and for, you know, having written material for Cirque du Soleil shows and for myself, you know, in my own artistic life, one of the things I've always stood behind was uh, they somebody had said, "Well, if you get the job, this is when I before I had started with Cirque du Soleil." Someone had said, "Well, you know, if you sign a contract with Cirque du Soleil, they'll own, you know, the act and the material that you create." And I said, "Yeah." And then you'll have to create more. That's why some uh, performers don't want to create within the construct of a corporation like that. It's because the material will be owned by the corporation and not you. Unless they have a pre-existing, they've created an act and then Cirque du Soleil found them and now they're going to get paid to do the act. So that's a different contract. But basically, people would say, aren't you worried about creating something from Cirque du Soleil? And then they'll own it. And you've done all this work. And I said, no. And they said, Mm -hmm. why? And I said, because I'm an infinite creator. Right. I can infinitely create. Anybody else can only, the, 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 the corporate machine of whatever it is, can only pay for copies or pay for you to create for them. They don't create. Everybody comes together, collaborates, and creates. Right. But I myself know I can infinitely create for my entire life. I can just keep creating because that's what we are. We are creative beings. Right. So. Therefore, by the same token, is this going somewhere? Yes, it is. It is, uh, yeah. Actually, I have a follow-up so point. <laughs> when, we come back to the, when we come back to the memory palace thing, you can't fill up a – I can what? Fill up a memory palace? Because I was really stingy with memory palaces until the last few weeks of really studying for this uh, beer exam. I was really – Really like, oh, I got to find a palace that's this big, or so many cubic feet and stations I want to fit inside, the whole thing. And now I'm just like, no, I need the material in. We're going to use this store. I don't recall all the angles of the store, but I, I only need four points. So we're just going to use this store and maybe this will dissolve and fade away. But then like I had a realization I was on the treadmill the other day and they have one of those virtual you know, it shows you running through the German woods or something, you know, woods in Germany. One of them on the screen was going through Las Vegas on the streets of Las Vegas. And since I performed there for years, this was a place I'd been. This was like me running into my own memory. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I've overlooked the fact that I didn't create anything in the entire my entire time in Las Vegas. I've not created any any mind palaces. Mm. I lived there for two years. Like the the strip is a mind palace for most of the planet. Right. <laughs> they know that old Vegas is here, and they know that the end is basically the Mandalay Bay. Um, yeah, Mandalay Bay. And then even if you want three points, that's a mind palace. That is a location map. It's a journey method, whatever you want to call it. It is a direct line with points that you've been to and memorized through your experiences there. Maybe you were there on a convention, so therefore you're in Caesar's Palace. And you know that the flamingo is here and over here, et cetera. So I realized I had not even utilized an entire city that I have experiences in. So yeah. therefore, how can I – why am I worried about using four places up in a store that I, I frequent down the street? doesn't make any sense because if I didn't remember that, then I probably don't remember – I haven't utilized anything where I lived in Montreal or any other city that I've lived in. Right. So this is all, uh, I think, evidence that we can't – expire we can't overuse these things uh it is perhaps only fear that is holding us back right well that's great and really what that speaks to also is there's no end to the desire to consume new things right Uh, right so that scarcity mindset that people have oh i don't want the corporation to own whatever is kind of bizarre because the corporation will never know that you're the right guy to write the sequel to your own thing yes. or whatever right <laughs> so it's, I, got the, I got the what is it everybody every uh, actors i i've written the perfect screenplay where is it it's in my head still yeah 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 <laughs> one day it will be huge but to, so it's like yeah to concrete 
to make a concrete connection to the the memory palace and memorizing verbatim, you come up with a poem and I don't know, just look at the first letter of the title of the poem and then think, do I know any place or, you know, so let's say the poem right. starts with M and then you think Montreal and, you know, uh, all of a sudden you've got resources. Yeah. Yeah. Alphabetizing. That was one of the things that you told me, uh, or recommended, uh, regarding my, this beer study and alphabetizing. And I'd already created mind palaces that were not in alphabetical order. And I'd already plugged in a ton of beers that was based on uh, geographic location. So it was starting with Belgium and then it was moving into the UK and, uh, England, and then it was coming around to Ireland. And so I had all these set up and locations and everything and characters. And then you said, maybe you should look at organizing by, you know, uh, how it's spelled. And all of a sudden I was like, oh man, alphabetically. And instead of going, here was my exact frame of thought, but I've already done an entire mind palace of size of a gigantic grocery store. And then my second thing I said to myself was, oh, please just move on and realize that you're going to be able to figure it out anyways. It doesn't take that long. And if you sit and complain about it, it'll just take longer. So why don't you just put everything alphabetical, put it into a different mind palace, not obsess on the fact that it has to start with the letter, even though that's going against what you just said. But I found when I started my mind palaces for Spanish, I was going, A, well, there's a store called Aldi. I'll use Aldi for the A's. And then I was like, okay, B, C, okay, I'm running out of D locations. I'm running out of E stores or, you know, I'm, and so with this new method of, of just like I have to get it done, all of the words that st- all of the beers – that start with A are all inside of a mind palace that's literally called D's six packs and brews and hot dogs, right. you know. But I didn't, I didn't even want to go like, oh, I should save this for the D's. I was like, dude, we just got to do this thing. Action speaks louder than overanalyzing and not doing anything at all. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point as well. I mean, speed of implementation is everything, and. The alphabet exercise you're referring to is really just to get people to have enough memory palaces so that they can choose from things and, you know, figure it out as you go along. Uh, Although I certainly do uh, myself in my own practice work with alphabetization quite frequently, but I often find that it does leap to some other memory palace. So, you know, I think it's key, though, because what you helped me with in doing that and why it's beneficial that I switched my whole thing that I was going with and instead did it your way, is now when I know there's a beer that starts with E, it's a guy going to be Eisenbach, English IPA, English Barley Wine, or English Porter. There will all be on E's. So right. just by someone saying Eisenbach, I go to E, and now I can see where the E's are. Right. I don't see the name of the store, which is a Walgreens. I don't see it's a Walgreens because I'm not going, oh, E must be at... Einstein's bagels shop or whatever, you know, right, um, right. leave it to other people to uh, organize that way when you have a little more time than I did at this time. Um, I was just like, what do I know? Shove information in there, move on to the next, let's do this thing. So, right, right. Uh, but by the same, so like, like to your point, if I know it's a D, I know where it is and how to find it immediately. And that's right. more important than anything. Right. Well, that's perfect. So, given the spirit of adventure in all of this, maybe take us a little bit into, you know, encoding a line of text. So, so I'll be good. It's a good example here because I was thinking of this as far as, now this is an example that's uh, learning foreign language. So it's one line. So the, the, the German line for what a beautiful evening. Aus für ein schöner Abend, right? Was für ein schönes Abend, yeah. Was für, ein, was für ein schöner Abend, right? Yeah. So what I saw... So Something that like one, this. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's one. Was für ein schöner Abend. So um, I was nervous because I realized I'm speaking with like a guy who spoke more German than me. Right. And so it's like all of a sudden like second guessing, which you should never do, but we do. Anyways, so, um, so was für ein schöner Abend is a perfect example. That does not have a place. The, the whole sentence does not exist in my head. What exists in my head is a vase... A fur coat, a giant eyeball. Right. I drew curtains and a stage, and it says, and underneath wrote show, and then dash er. And here's one of those things that 
I love about our memories is you can get really specific with the imagery, but then you can like add on things that don't necessarily make sense, but they stick still because you got the first part in there. So it was like show. Oh, it's show. Here's a show. There's curtains and a stage. Nerd. Well, I could put a nerd there. So it's show nerd. And, you know, I, and I, and you could have done that, but I didn't, I just went show. It's a show dash er. It's a shower. Shoner. Right, so Schoner, uh, a bent was a barbell with a bend in the middle, so mm. it would be very difficult to use. So was for ein Schoner, a bent. and the funny thing is, it's not a sentence that I've used enough to be like, oh yeah, it's part. It's not dissolving. The imagery is not dissolving at any time. I'm like, how do you say? I say to myself, how do I say, what a beautiful evening in German, and then I say to myself, I see a, va- a vase, a vase. What's the next thing? And so each one I'm discovering the next thing, but it leads you to perfect memorization. Mm. So was, fur, ein, schoner, abend. I literally don't know how the sentence is ending until I've gone through the imagery. So it's a really weird thing. And that and that only comes from in that second nature of knowing the entire thing or it does the background, the framework of which we're talking about. Uh, dissolving only comes through repetition. And obviously I haven't uh, repeated it enough, but I've repeated it enough in the slow visual manner that I'm able to say it whenever I want. But it sometimes does not sound like was für ein schoner Abend. It sometimes sounds like was für ein schoner Abend. Mm. And then I repeat it again to make clean it up and make it better. So that's a perfect example of how literally the imagery and the encoding is throwing breadcrumbs for me to follow the entire way to know verbatim what I'm saying. Right, right. So. For our German purists listening to this, uh, Please. We, we, I'm not exactly sure, actually, if it's was für einen schönen Abend or was für uh, ein yes. schönes Abend. It wouldn't be schönes, I don't think. But the, the reason why I want to pause on this is that I don't think it's schöner, I uh, Abin. I think it's more like Schernin. Um, and it might, it could be Einem or Eine, uh, was for Eine, Schern, eine Schern, Schernin Abend, was for Ein Schernin Abend, I would guess. But here's an interesting thing, because I've done German on uh, YouTube before and people have, you know, said, oh, you didn't even try to pronounce it correctly or etc. etc. But here's something. I was with Ollie Richards one time in Berlin and Ollie from I will teach you a language dot com. And I was showing off my German a little bit uh, and talking. We were getting ice cream. And this is a situation I've had many, many times in my German uh, experience. But I asked the woman in front of Ollie, I just said, what's the correct grammar here? She said, keine Ahnung, no idea. Right. <laughs> this is a native German speaker. And I've had right. this in taxi cabs and with all kinds of native German speakers and so forth. So regardless of the, the correctness of, of, of that particular gra- grammatical um, uh, situation, the thing I want to point out for language learners, and it happens to me all the time every day with Chinese, I speak with my father-in-law uh, like pretty much every day, is you got to just get it out. And often you can the... clean it up and learn, yeah. <laughs> but often the native speakers won't even, won't even know. In that case... They, they might, but often they just don't know. Um, and so you can correct by just using and hearing and and so on. And I'm not the person to correct you because I'm not a German teacher, but um, rather than oh, like, I, hey... And I've literally only studied this long enough that I saw it in my uh, uh, <laughs> How to Speak German book. Right, right, uh, right, right. And, and it spelled it out in sections, you know? So I literally wrote out what it was sounding like. I have no idea how it spells. And it was like, oh, okay, well, this sounds like something that I would love to say when we stepped outside of a building. Right. So right. as we can see, the, uh, the, the, uh, once again, sticking with our theme, the thing that drives all of my memory experiences is uh, being able to step outside of a building after doing your toasts and having your dinner and then finishing with witty recitations of poetry. You right. can step outside right. and pronounce it correctly. Right, right. And, right, right. and, and to our point, um, it doesn't really matter how it's pronounced un- until you learn the best way possible um, and break it down into the visual images of whatever way you heard. Right. right. I know from my study of both uh, some recitation in 
Latin and Hebrew as well as some Greek that uh, I have secret YouTube pages that have uh, me doing things and, and doing recitations in these other languages. And most of the page is like, he's not even close. And then the other page is like, yeah, that's how I pronounce it. And then you go back to, okay, well, uh, it's going to get dicey around here. Um, right. What are we doing with it? You know, uh, you know. So, um, but I suggest to everyone that you research it more than necessarily looking only in one book that has a, a pronunciation and then making some images. Right, Especially right, if right, you're right. going to YouTube, because they're waiting for you, buddy. They're waiting for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I mean. That's why I want to pause that's upon why. it because it's... Oh, that was good. Good call. Good call. It's such an interesting point in memory. And the role of mistakes is so essential. And, you know, I'm glad you pointed out reciting in these other languages because even in Sanskrit, uh, I, I don't know if you saw it. I did the, the, the... I think you may have been there. I did... The, yeah, I, I saw a comment. I don't know if you were there the live or you did it as an after-effect comment. But uh, I did the Sanskrit. And I know damn well that a lot of what I'm pronouncing is not the correct pronunciation. And I can't right. even find uh, a native, if there is one, a native speaker of Sanskrit to um, to copy. I only have uh, the record of Gary Weber doing it, and somehow my mouth just doesn't quite do it. It's from a video, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really it's being understood, even if it's just you that's doing the understanding that, that comes down to things. Absolutely. And I think too many times... People are so hung up on the details of – because I know Sanskrit is one of those things – You that's why you have so many different versions of the Gita. That's why you have so many versions you know, all over the place. The uh, Srila Prabhupada Hare Krishna version is going to be a different version than the Yogananda Kriya Yoga uh, Sanskrit, which will be a different one to the each interpretation – and uh, and then again, you know, most people, a lot of Westerners, especially learning these things, are just focused on the devotional aspect or the the experience of the thing, and not necessarily going to get into a debate with a uh, Sanskrit scholar. Right, right. Well, and neither will you in a taxi cab. I mean, I remember practicing. <laughs> It's a it's kind of a crazy situation, but when I was in Beijing, I asked many taxi drivers if I could marry their daughter, and uh, it was you know never totally arrived at if my pronunciation was good enough. It's just like the message got across. Yeah, and they knew why I was practicing, and uh, I mean I asked them, could I practice with you or whatever, and they knew why I was practicing that particular phrase and uh, the right. conversation I was trying to have with them to practice, and. Uh, yes. No one ever like started to lecture me on this or that grammatical detail, although you know right. certain certain YouTube commenters will. Uh, well, <laughs> they're there for that's why we trust them. Right, <laughs> they're always there doing the work. We just don't have time to. Right, we're too busy enjoying the process. But uh, I mean, there is a point though when we're talking about verbatim, where certainly accuracy does matter, and I'm sure in your experience as an actor you've worked with directors where it's on the page or it's you know if That's it's it, not, not saying, you know yeah. what am i trying to say here if it's not from the page it's not on the stage that kind of thing like some people really want word for word as right. opposed to you know being able to vary the text or just completely you know iterate something fresh from spontaneous uh, acting or whatever so people aren't paying to go see Shakespeare and then hear you riffing. Right, right. Unless it's like a bizarre experimental German version like I saw Hamlet. He came on the stage I had for my birthday front row seats and the guy came and he was just like, he asked me, where's your ticket? And he put the mud on his hand on my pants and stuff. Anyway, it was a weird situation. I should find that picture for this video of the mud on my pants from Hamlet. But he definitely wasn't following the script. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But in any case, when you do verbatim memorization and, you know, you wrote your own poem or you're memorizing something from Bukowski, I think I've seen you do, um, you know, there is actual strict verbatim. And so right. what is your process for when you've realized, and I've certainly done this, that there's, that's not the right word? Like, how do you deal with that? How do you correct? Um, yeah, that was, that was one of the things I've um, – because and, and I think it comes about naturally in – 
organic stages when you're doing this sort of thing. We shouldn't be expecting ourselves to everything works out the first time, first draft, it's all perfect. There's no need to suffer ourselves through those illusions. But what happens is you think you've got an idea for it and then you realize, oh, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. And you think you have this chunk memorized. And then when you read it again, you realize it's, it says often instead of um, sometimes or it's, you know, you didn't nail, you had the idea of what it was, but you didn't have the verbatim down. Yeah. So for example, uh, in the beer studies I've been doing, uh, Weissbier and Weizen. So both of those are German. Here we're right. treading gently back into German. Um, <laughs> what about the Hefeweizen? Uh, Hefeweizen. Yeah, Hefeweizen, all this. <laughs> so, so to my brain, I'm studying this stuff from the outside. And if you don't have much experience with this, uh, not growing up around it your entire life, you're like, well, these words sound similar. Weiss, Weiss W-E-I-S-S-E, um, W-E-I-Z-E-N, Weizen, right. Weiss, they're very similar. They sound the same. We have a W that sounds like a V. They both end in the, a closed syllable S. And so it's obviously very similar. No, no, it's not as similar because one is white and one is wheat. But they're both wheat beers. Hi, thanks for that. And um, so, so how are you going to differentiate with a foreign word to you that doesn't make sense but sounds very similar? Well, um, uh, for vice, I just drew a vice crushing, you know, a white vice. So it was white because the word meant v- white beer, vice beer. Right. So it was a white vase. Okay, and then for the uh, visor, I had a visor from a car, a visor that also was like, uh, uh, oh, a visor, and then I could have uh, an ER on the side. Oh, yeah, a visor that came across with some wheat sticking out of it. So I made the the imagery a little easier because what was happening is anytime I was seeing these two things, I was going, oh, wheat, white, white, wheat, white, white, wheat, wheat. I don't know. They're very similar. So I had to actually nail them down so that I had some kind of an image because to hear them in passing would have been too similar, especially if you've never heard or read these things before. So that kind of imagery when you're saying vice beer and I see a vice crushing it and making the beer and it's a white vice is very specific and helpful. And so then you don't – you know with the difference between the one just by the imagery you're able to tell – Exactly. And so this is uh, helpful if you have things that sound the same right. and you make imagery that differentiates. Um, so what I usually do is I do a rundown of the entire piece doing imagery and seeing – sometimes it flows. Like Bukowski doesn't write – he's not Shakespeare, but he's got the heart and soul, the simplicity. So usually it's not too complicated. It's easier to remember – uh, we are here to drink beer. We are here to kill war. We are here. So so that was just memorized, like I posted on one of our things. In the time that it took, uh, the whole little poem was memorized in the time it took for my muscles to reset after doing like a set of pull-ups or whatever, you know. Right. So I was like, oh, I saw the quote somewhere and went, oh, that's cool. It's got beer in it, and that pertains to what I'm studying, and it's Bukowski. It's got a nice line, and it's poetic, so let's do that. And so for that one, I again, I just took a quick list and then started to – and it wasn't like I had to get really complicated with the visuals. We're here to drink beer. I'm like, duh. And then uh, – and it has a nice little ring to it. So sometimes you don't even need entire imagery because the rhythm of it – and this, is, this will lead us into the – writing hip hop type of thing. Right. In the beginning you you what happens is sometimes you'll find that organic uh, flow of a line makes sense when you have a rhythm. The rhythm itself becomes a pattern that is memorable. Right. And it's not until the pattern changes that you start to oh I gotta make a picture. But when we you say the first lines of that Bukowski poem, we are here to drink beer, we are here to We are here to drink beer. We are here to kill war. Obviously, kill war doesn't rhyme with beer, but you have the same beginning for both of them. 
Right. And all I had to do was make a beer and then like a tank or whatever war, killing killing war. Right. So uh, two images differentiated two lines. So that was uh, kind of how we, I broke down somebody else's material. And I find things that you write yourself because they – you were, they were created in a logical fashion, one line at a time. It's often easier to remember, but the longer it goes, the more difficult it becomes because you lose the. It takes some still recall rehearsal practice in order to get into that flow or to remember what mindset you were in that made you logically think this line and this line. That's one of the things I literally enjoy doing, is to take a song. And you, you read the lines, but to think about, to consciously think about the fact that they wrote the first line, the first line led to the second line. Everything was a thought that led to another thought. So when you're about three or four thoughts down, you're actually, sometimes that's why you have a line, the first line sometimes doesn't make any sense at all. And then all of a sudden it starts to take a format. And then that becomes a chorus because it's like, I didn't know what I was doing today. And that's how they started writing was like a blank piece of paper going, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Right. So it, you can actually reverse engineer and go, oh, he only chose this because this word rhymed with that. Or you can start to reverse engineer those things, which is not a fun uh, experiment to do with other people's um, artistic creations. But um, I find that things that you've written yourself, because you – you had a line by the same token, and it led to the next line, and it led to the next line. You're able to see a sort of logical path because right. you created it, and you see the through line of the gist of what you're headed for. And that is in itself easier to recapture later to memorize. Right. Um, but once again, uh, nailing down your imagery and breaking down the words when you do go off-roading there – uh, and don't really hit that specifying the exact image is a lot more important right so that's clear, clearer yeah that's really brilliant and i mean it's a it's a, a hard thing for people to understand until they do it but you don't need an image on a word by word basis so i'll give you one actually that you may already know but i think uh you're gonna love if you don't which is filled with mingled cream and amber. I will raise this glass again. Such hilarious visions clamber through the chambers of my brain. Quaintest thoughts and queerest fancies, fancies come to life and fade away. What care I how time passes? I am drinking ale today. Now that's uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And filled with mingled cream and amber. All I see is Edgar Allan Poe in the memory palace with a glass that he's drinking. And uh, right. he, he like mingles it a little bit, you know, before he drinks it, and that's it. Like the act, there's no image for filled, it, other than the fact that the cup is filled, you know. Um, Amber, I, I I have a vague memory. I don't want to invent stuff, but I have a vague memory of thinking about the traffic light around the corner from the memory palace, like to that's get funny. that word amber. I don't know if I did or not, but if I didn't, that was that's a good idea to now, <laughs> you know. That yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, if you were to go through it, there's no word for word association at all. It's almost exactly. as much as possible one to two images per line. Uh, is that similar in your experience? Yes. So uh, the <clears throat> and one of the things that you start to learn to do is gauge how much information you're trying to chunk into one section of memory. So or in the, like, say, the body list for that poem, Chanting Amram of mine. How much I, – I sometimes – well, with this one especially, I was like, I figure I got this. Let's see. And I was jamming in way more information, and it was just based on how it laid on the page, I think. looked like this was a logical chunk that made sense before we changed the topic to this part. So therefore, um, people should experiment with how much they're comfortable with. Uh, what they, what they, they it's kind of like you're you don't know until you do it, yeah. and you you start to experiment and go oh, and if you see like the last two lines fade away, you probably put too much into this chunk, so break it down into smaller chunks, and then from there go into imagery or the locations. Right. Um. So for for the chanting Amram poem, 
Um, as this planet moves in space and the cosmos relates to the gravitational pulls of planetary bullies, quarks and black holes, while back on Earth, souls sift and slump sleeping, blood and hearts beating, with two ears and a mind. So I had all of that in one chunk. Right. Uh, which made sense to me. And that's another thing I love about memory work is it made sense – is like Dr. Yip on that video I just reposted. <coughs> Dr. Yip, why is 223 or whatever <coughs> a candy store? But to me, it's a candy store. Right. It's like, what? That didn't explain anything. <laughs> 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 he just repeated what the question was. But to me, 223 is a candy store. And it's like, okay. And you mm -hmm. throw your hands up and go, well. I guess that makes sense. So right. sometimes, you know, it just makes sense that, oh, that makes sense. You know, it's like the show and drawing a picture of a show and then adding er. Right, right. You know, just kind of like sketching your way through it because we're all just uh, developing our comfort levels with the memorizing, with, with what our bodies are comfortable memorizing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the Bukowski example that you gave – to me, beer and war, they end the same. So I'd almost, you know, have like that R, the, 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 right. like the end alliteration helped me in some sense, um, which would make zero sense to other people. Um, but nonetheless, that's the whole game here is to be the scientist in the laboratory of your mind and run the experiments and observe the process and change it as you go along, you know, and, and you just... Get a you get a real feel for, oh, I don't need that. Eventually, as you've done this over and over again, you start to get a real feel for like, mm, that's not going to stick unless I add a stupid thing here. And sometimes you you have you struggle with an exact alliteration to put to make the word stick, um, which I had. I don't have evidence of it right now, but basically. Like I said, you know, showing a show and then adding er because you're lazy instead of adding a nerd, like show nerd, right? Something like that. But instead, you're like, eh, dash er, whatever. We're moving on. It's a show nerd, and it was like, where did the end go? I don't know, but I didn't forget it. So that's kind of uh, I like that our brains fill in those blanks for us, and right. sometimes make it so that it's like, now oh, you get the idea, brain. Yeah, I do. High five, and then we move on to the next line. Uh, but you only get that through practice, really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So amazing how much you can do, or how where your comfort zone is. Right. Practice is everything. It's a. Uh, I think of it a lot as being somewhere between playing the piano and a martial art. You know, it's. Yeah. Your ability to to do this is going to come down to, you know, did you learn the basics? Did you put them into action? Did you turn a scale into a song? Uh, did you turn a kata into sparring? You know, like. Right. Did you? <laughs> uh, right. And, and, and the more you do, the more you'll get. Exactly. It's the activity that makes it all happen. So without it. So for um, memorizing, that was a good example. The Chanting Amram poem w took place on, uh, it was a few pages of material, and it had big chunks of stanzas that started to stick. But I did add things like vast compositions, and I wrote a little composition book. And I showed I showed vast by just being a line with two ends to it. So it was like vast, right. you know, whatever you have to do to. And that's another fun thing. I'm, I'm being a creative uh, person anyways. This I think I said this on the podcast, but the, the memory techniques, what they gave to me was a way to be obsessive, compulsive, creatively without having to carry around magic props or anything else to uh you know, coins or things to uh, manipulate. Instead, I can walk around uh, and and be in my own head, reviewing, recalling, coming up with things, seeing what I should memorize, paying attention to the. Uh, it's an entire life strategy, really. As you start going further and further down the memorization um, rabbit hole, you start to look. Oh, this is a room, but now it no, it's not a longer a room. Now it's a mind palace. Now it's able to be utilized. How are we going to utilize it and what are we going to do? And there's so much uh, richness we can pull out of all of these small moments that were like me standing in line or waiting to lift weights again. And all of a sudden I have a poem I can offer people. 
things that I can offer up. And that's also one of the things, I mean, really in memorizing poetry, really what we're doing is we're offering like a shiny, beautiful gem that mm. someone else who has way more skill at whatever that was created. And then we're giving the gift to another person who may never have encountered this beautiful gem. Right. And so it's, uh, uh, a noble tradition, in fact, because we are able to give the gift that they would experience without us being there, but we got to pay it forward. And that's why doing that poem, that other Bukowski poem, The Laughing Heart, at the at the uh, culmination of my prison uh, performance was so powerful, was take being literally being in an environment where things are controlled and limited and being able to walk in with memorized freedom right would you do a poem for us sure let me think of what uh which one i will do uh i've done well let's take a moment i guess yeah so the <clears throat> i guess i could do the laughing heart i hope it's word perfect otherwise this will be horrible <laughs> and my dream will also be a uh, fall down but um the Laughing Heart from Charles Bukowski. I have a recording we could, we could judge myself on in my performance here as well on my YouTube site. But <clears throat> it's a beautiful poem by Charles Bukowski called The Laughing Heart, if you'd like to look it up. I have already have a reading of it on my uh, YouTube page. So we have to go into our – actually go into our old mind palace here in Burbank, California, where I moved into after performing in Sister Act 2. I don't even know if I – might be easier to go with Crowley on this one. I'm not sure if either will turn out well. But I just had – I went into my mind palace and then I saw nothing at that first part. I, but I heard my favorite line, which is two steps ahead. So let's see again. I go into the parking spot. I'm inside the car. Your life is not – I want to skip to the next line, which is on the staircase and not inside the car. Your life – is your life. That's in the car. Now to the steps. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. Front door. Be on the watch. Mailbox. There are ways out. Swimming pool. There is a light somewhere. Deep into the swimming pool. <laughs> Sorry that I'm walking you through my mind palace, but I think it's more pertains to what we're talking about. Indeed. <clears throat> deep end of the swimming pool. It may not be much light. Front door. There is out. May not be much light. There are ways out. Your life is your life. The gods will offer you chances. Know them. Take them. Here we come into one of those moments where I go offering or is it something else? Because I had to specify it was a hiccup. Life is, don't be to be clumped into tank so we shouldn't be on the walk. But there's a light somewhere. It may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. The gods will offer you chances. Know them. Take them. And the more you learn to do it, the more light there will be. <clears throat> your life is your life. Know it while you have it. You are marvelous. The gods wait to delight in you. Sorry that took so long, but I actually – it's from a while ago, and I haven't done the poem. Not was, enough re 
new material. Um, that was my first question. How long do you think it's been since you recited it? Uh, I, I think the last time I recited it was that video that I did with you like three months ago. Right. So that's, so, quite, that's quite good. So <clears throat> that's what's so amazing, too, about this. You know, that wasn't a necessarily impressive uh, feat for people uh, hanging out at home, but it gave them a bathroom break. Um, but the uh, – the, um, that's what's so amazing about this, too. With the whole time-spaced repetition thing, like uh, the rules of how long you should wait in memorizing, you know, uh, one hour and then, one, you know, two hours, five hours, one day, three days, et cetera. Um, one of the challenges I've found is it's so f fun and challenging to plug in new material that there's – Nobody ever mentions the glamour of scheduling time to go through all of your mind palaces mm -hmm. and review all of this stuff. Right. Because often you don't. I mean, I repeat the shower, the chanting Amram in the shower every day. So that's why the the stations are disappearing. Because I wrote that and I might use it again. Well, I have to know it for a poetry reading that I'm going to be going to. So it was like, oh, I don't want to miss that one mustn't to disappear right, but right. the laughing heart i haven't used in a few months and other things so you literally have to get a schedule to keep all of your mind palaces in uh recall review mode because otherwise how are you gonna it's easy to break it down it, i mean it's not easy this is all work it's easy to say you're gonna break it down and then you break it down and then you've got it memorized and you feel good about yourself and without the recall review portion and rehearsal, mm. it can disappear and fade away. And so I actually had to start writing out what I'm going to review and recall. And the other morning, like I uh, said on the podcast, I wake up at like four or five in the morning and naturally laying in bed want to start to go, oh, I'm kind of awake. Well, we'll review some mind palaces, and then I start to go through the mind palaces as I'm laying in bed. And the uh, now with all this beer material, I've been plugging into so many like you know 15 different mind palaces. It's like you're in bed for an hour going through mind palaces of material, recalling 78 beer styles of the world, or the entire 12 steps of brewing method, or commercial recommendations for uh, Schwarz beer and all this and all. Uh, it, and then wh wh what about all of your poetry? You've got to recall that too. And don't forget the fact that there's a five-minute re recitation of uh, Kipling's conundrum of the workshop you got to work on. But yeah. it is fascinating to me that when in a pinch you can focus. Like I really thought I was getting nervous because I'm here on, uh, you know, there's witnesses. But I really thought, well, I should just, you know, your brain says, just ditch it. Just go away. And I was like, no, I know what the line is that's connected to the stairs. So if I go one step back into the car, which I never go into that because I automatically assume I know the first line of the poem. Mm -hmm. So I never have to go. But that's not my favorite line. I love the dank submission. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission line is like a great line. Right. So your life being your life, even though it's repeated three times, somehow disappeared. But that's what's so incredible is for a poem – that I haven't thought about in months <laughs> to be able to step back and see I'm inside the car in the parking spot that I had when I was 20 years old, you know, right. 25 years ago or whatever to go back into that and have that information there is it's phenomenal. And I can't see how people don't call this magic. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think it does seem uh, well, it is magic for sure in, in some real meaning of that sense, but uh, like leisure domain or anything like that, it certainly is a, is a skill. And I think it's remarkable. I mean, we haven't looked at the actual record and compared, but that is very remarkable and a testament to, to the skill and also to your ability to focus in the moment Get past. I believe I missed one line inside the kitchen. There's oh, okay. a kitchen line. <clears throat> I believe there's a kitchen line because I have a few lines that are in this kitchen, and there's something in there that's missing. But we'll, I'll only know 
I might yeah, never yeah. know because I might not. But I'll only know when the YouTube comments start. <laughs> but when you, you know, if you were going to go and perform it again, uh, this is the prison. Yeah, I would just like brush it up and make sure. And what I would do is clarify because I did have to clarify. And this is funny, and it's to our point too, that one of the lines that take place inside the kitchen mine palace area was a line that I had memorized incorrectly and then came back to it and had to tweak it and make it more specific. Mm. The more that you learn to do it, the more light there will be. Uh, so I had to like go back and go, oh, that isn't the line, because I recited it for someone, but I handed them the paper. Right. And so I was kind of checking myself. I said, here, let me check this real quick. That's probably the last time I did it, and that still was like three months ago. But um, I, I but I tooled that one section, and obviously I haven't uh, gone through and reviewed this uh, this enough. But it really plays to the point of which I've been thinking to myself a lot the last few days is how do you schedule enough time to go through? Once you, it's easy for everybody to say create more mind palaces and fill them, but we never say and. Schedule time when you're scheduled to go back through them all because that's really important if you're going to carry all this material around. Well, it's a good question and let's think it through. So there's a difference between your beer project and verbatim memorization. And I wouldn't be the person to judge which has more demands than the other. But from a sort of performative sense. True. When you want to rattle something off the top of your head, uh, like I, I just did with the, the thing, maybe I've got a word off here and there. I actually change ale to beer sometimes when I pronounce it. And so I'm, I was thinking before I said it to you, is it really ale or is it something? Uh, whatever. But like, right, right, right. Th there, there may be like a little word off here and there. But the reason and the, what I, the Edgar Allan Poe thing I said is a little bit shorter than yours, but that sort of rattling it off years later comes from having performed it uh, multiple right. times. But I no longer review it in the sense of recall rehearsal. Uh, right. And, you know, if we think of other lines of Peleus, son Achilles, sing, O muse, the vengeance deep and deadly, whence to Greece unnumbered ills arose. Like, there's a certain difference between the verbatim memorization and the memorization of the performance. Right. 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 So that's the thing. That's the thing. And that's where the, the chanting Amram poem, I'm, I pref wrote it to perform mm. and then performed it and then memorized. I, I memorized it enough to perform it for a video to be released on his birthday. And then I reviewed it every day in the shower for the mm. last few months to just, and so that's why it sounds like that sort of, uh, uh, just flows off the tongue type of thing as opposed to the Bukowski poem where you had to go line for line painstakingly through a, a mind palace uh, because you, it didn't wasn't important to me to know. It was really important when I performed in the prison to know it because I was comfortable with it and I was performing for, you know, at least a quarter of the crowd was looking angry at me. So that was a rough, rough crowd. So that was but it, but it didn't matter because I knew I was offering gold. Right. And just because they don't have eyes to see the, the gold of Bukowski's poem of not of, of giving yourself the opportunity for the future right. um, doesn't matter. But, yeah, there is a thing. And, and you're right with the beer information. I have to know that for a test and the stuff that's going to stick is going to stick. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that always is true is the ones you got wrong on the test are the ones that stick with you for the rest of your life and you never have to review them ever again because they've already made an impression on you and you know them forever. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, the, the other thing there is that in, in getting that to a longer-term memory where you could perform it with more of a performance and, uh, and less of a recitation from memory... Mm -hmm. would just simply, and this is the answer to the question of scheduling, would be to schedule it a sufficient number of times until that you feel certain a couple of years later you could do it. And I would think, okay, Bukowski, maybe Tuesday is Bukowski day, you know? Right. And so instead of Amram in the shower, 
it's Bukowski. And once a week should be more than enough for about, oh, I don't know. No, there's no magical number. Uh, there is magic, but no magic numbers <laughs> in terms right. of like how many times you do it. So someone like Dominic O'Brien would say five, like the rule of five would be maybe once a day for five days, then once a week for five weeks, then once a month for five months. That's basically his suggestion with the rule of five. I'd be a bit more vigorous with that for a lot of stuff, like five times the first day, then five times the first five days. Absolutely. Um, but it depends on the nature of the information and so forth. But if, you know, off the cuff performance is the goal, then certainly you just need to do the enough sufficient recitation to get there, um, which I'm sure would would bear true in, in most acting with the acting world generally being that, you know, if you're not going to perform it again, why would you do that? Um, right. Uh, so. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing too. And in, in acting and in performing uh, music or lyrics or rapping, all of these things, you're not really riffing too much. You're, you know what the words are and where they're, you know, going to lay out. Right. right. So there's things that are automatic. There's, you know, and through repetition, it's like there's a I have a pocket verse. It's a rap verse that I call my pocket verse because I know I can be. It it, it became it was a great line or a great little paragraph of a song I wrote in 1998, and everybody reacted really well to it. So it, the song itself got cut down. The song came out and nobody cared. And then the little that section became important. And then when I would repeat that section, it was like, dang, that's really got some really cool imagery and things going on in it. And that became the pocket verse, which you knew that even if you had had, you know, vodka and everything else that put all those weights on you, that you'd still be able to pull the pocket verse out because of the fact that you've been reciting it, re you know, recitating it for, uh, for, well, you know, over a decade. And so... There's a good example of something that in the beginning was, oh, I got to read the lyrics. OK. And then it became so second nature that you knew, oh, uh, hey, you, you, you weren't expecting to perform tonight, but why don't you come up and do something? And then it was like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm And then the beat rolls and you're like, oh, God, you know, 100 people watching you and drinking and judging. Like, why is he white and going to rap? And then they're like handing you the microphone and your stress level's going out of control. And you're like, what could I do? I have so many songs. I could do anything. Just stick with the pocket verse. <laughs> and, and so I'll do the pocket verse really quick as an example of something that, once again, anything you want to memorize can be this easy. Hopefully it's this easy. Let's see. <laughs> pocket verse uh, goes... <clears throat> You could take a hit off a rivulet of my spit and trip for weeks. The mescaline freaks call me on the phone to smell me speak and start tripping, flipping their visions like a kaleidoscope, segmented eyes like a fly until they're getting dizzy, drunken, Picasso, toxic, colossal, got you nauseous off this poison falafel, Kafka novel, Yogananda brothel, Salvador, Dalai Lama, Rigardi party, talking Stephen Hawking, David Lynch sandwich, imprisoned in a prism prison. I got the mugwump jism dripping, liquid toxin down my chin when I'm in the middle of my venomous assassination, the condensation erodes the thickest steel or concrete I can hear the streets you can hear the streets creaking creep when I speak Greek sympathetic vibrations make the pavement break awaken my mind's ability to penetrate you through my spectacular vernacular manslaughter bird god martyr bird arm warrior toxic courier for the massive grafted masses at this axis circumambulating energy liquid amphetamine freak every time I speak here when your thoughts caught in my mind's eye cube of space erased eradicate this place this age while my spit drops to the stage I'm the white devil mystical mage amazing <laughs> uh so that's a good example of something that i wrote in 97 1998 okay. which became rep repeated so often that it was like eh, i should just make that a pocket verse so i could pull it out and i'd just get used to it and so that was one of the ones for the vh1 show uh the next great white rapper I went and uh, auditioned for that in 2005 and uh, fortunately didn't get it. That was a big lifesaver. I missed that bullet because that would have been atrocious. And um, so because basically they just wanted 
people on there. The uh, it's the same excuse I was given all the other times was that was incredible. I just can't even wrap my mind around what you just said. That was so cool. But we're looking for a guy to go, yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Mm-hmm. Yo. And that's what they were looking for. So making literary references and everything right. um, and talking about you know, metaphysics and literary references wasn't necessarily going to be featured on the next <laughs> VH1 show. Right. <laughs> I can only imagine the them even, you know, picking out the Zen of maybe the David Lynch sandwich reference, but right, right, you know, possibly in, prison, in a prison prison, right. <laughs> That's what I like about it too. It's one of those ones that hits you with an eye of a visual, and by the time you've like what, you're already onto the next visual, and then you're what? It's like the Simpsons, uh, the original Simpsons uh, lines that punchline. We want goal. We want to get you to get a laugh every three seconds you know, or five seconds, you know, boom. Well, let's change gears a little bit because I think uh, an opportunity is here to speak about something a little bit different uh, that you can speak to because of this. So as I mentioned before we got on camera here, I'm a little bit uh, in sleep debt because I broke my normal com- curfew to see Jordan right. Peterson. And uh, one of the things that came up was the problem of teachers no longer helping students learn how to read. And so I get MTV, well, I, I don't agree with it, but like I can get MTV not wanting literature, even though if I think of rappers, I mean, I would say Eminem with his three and four syllable words is an example of some pretty intellectual... There's reading um, going on, yeah. Yeah, there's reading going on, and... I mean, I haven't followed his career in the last couple of years, but I remember some of the some of the things back in uh, even just two thousand uh, two thousand ten two thousand nine were just like wow, like those are five right. s- syllable words in there, and he's making references that that aren't just you know serial killers in pop culture. So, um, what I'm getting at is like, what do you just think generally about what appears to be a mass dumbing down of culture as a person? who memorizes literature, who obviously loves words, the possibility, the potential, the robustness of language to help us cross bridges provided we're willing to step on the bridge and and walk through it. Like what, what's your feeling about that uh, at the present day? uh, I was just discussing this with someone and it's very, on the one hand, it's a, it's kind of a scary idea, scary time, because I do see so much of just like click. I mean, your YouTube will just automatically play as you sit there watching the hypno toad uh, mm-hmm. forever. So it is a a time that is kind of scary in that sense. And then another thing, so uh, while at the same time people are writing more than ever, in fact, because of the fact that they have to write emails and text messages. So mm-hmm. on the one hand, you're writing more. There's spell check and all this other stuff, sure. But in addition to that, there was an article that came out last year that showed that large swaths of the country of, of India have very low literacy. And they don't need literacy because they now have smartphones where they can speak and it translates into what they want and then plays back what they want to say in another language. Or they speak and it searches for videos that they can watch, you know, Bollywood videos and the things. So it was an interview that was done talking with many different uh, people and lower – I mean they were employed. So you, it's hard to judge, you know, India's uh, poverty level because it's com- something completely foreign to me. But, but basically these are working people who ha- aren't necessarily completely literate but do know enough to have cell phones now, smartphones that they can hit hit record and then it will record what they're saying and bring up videos so you no longer have to be able to write or read mm. in order to get hit with a bunch of videos and enjoy your evening and go back to bed and wake up and go to work. So that's mm. kind of a scary – there's a scary balance while we're writing – more because people also, um, conversely, have said, "Oh, I'm, I make, 
I don't need to write. What am I needing to take writing class for? And then they grow up and now they're writing emails and text messages every day. So people are writing a lot. And we have things, um, AI apps like Grammarly, et cetera, that will adjust things and edit um, accordingly. So I'm seeing both sides uh, on there, but it scares me a lot. And that's why I sometimes have to just shut everything off. And today I was a good example of a day that I was scared, scared um, because of the fact that I spent – I had this is my third day off. And I was like relaxing. So you go, oh, I'm going to relax. I'm going to watch some videos. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm watching more videos. And then it's like, okay, I'm watching more videos. And all of a sudden you're watching other people watching videos. And then another person comes in and they're on their phone watching videos. And then I start to go, holy crap, I got to get out of this. And I shut things off. And I even had to shut off. The only reason like a radio, like an AM radio came on was because of the fact that my impulses said, oh, this is the time that usually I want to listen to this. Click. Oh, check in. No, I just got to focus here. And even listening to like classical music, which is usually my come down or my relaxation. Today, I had to like even block that out because I was thinking of uh, the diet, the dopamine diet uh, that was on that podcast that you and um, Jonathan did, I think. But um. Going on a dopamine diet where you just lock yourself down. And, um, and I was like, that sounds like something that should happen. I really believe what I'm hearing <laughs> about releasing ourselves from this. And it's not going to go away. You know, this is not going to go away. And I don't think enough people use discipline to require that they get away from YouTube and get away from apps and noises and things you know and sometimes all it takes is for me i've been burning cds of classical music or relaxing meditational whatever music in the background i've been burning cds of things that you, i normally listen to on a computer just so that i don't have to have the computer on to listen to them and this is a sign of like i can't believe i'm i'm making the extra step to burn a CD so I can put it on a thing that's not connected to the internet just so I can listen to it. And I know this is going to sound like, oh, what is, it? What is this guy? Is you know, anti-technology or something? No, I completely love the technology. But I believe we really, in order to hold on to our attentions, and like you've said before, the studies are not out <laughs> on what the results are going to be with all this stuff. So the more that we are reading actual books, the more that we're reciting poetry, the more that we're listening to music and connecting with other individuals, I feel that benefits us uh, for longer. And re reading that book, uh, you recommended The Brain. Right. David Eagleman, I think, is the other. Yeah, Yeah, David Eagleman and the beginning of that book and how our – so for babies being born, they're, they're, they, have all, they don't make the connections until like the first – after the first two years, all those connections are made depending on their environment and the language and everything. And can't the same be said that as we keep on evolving and we keep on changing throughout of our lives that we're still, you know, it might be decreasing in these things. But at the same time, there is an effect going on, right? We, yeah. It didn't stop affecting us as organic beings. So therefore, what are the effects? And I'm not paranoid about it, but I find that I'm – I inflict upon myself some kind of discipline to turn things off and get things quiet. And I feel like I don't even do a good job, but at least I have the thought to do it. Yeah. Whereas others flow down the stream of, Oh, just, mm. I told it, I, I did, I wrote a blog post in 2009, I think it was, and it was called techno captivity. And I was like railing on it. And that was right before I got rid of my cell phone and we went like burner phone and, where this is absolutely not happening. I'm not ha being listened to all the time. And I went down that whole rabbit hole and then eventually deemed that, no, the future is happening, Christian, whether you uh, you buy into it or not, it's happening. So you better adapt to the technology that's here. Go, You could pay the same amount for something that doesn't work at all. Right, right. Yeah, no, those are all interesting points. And to our point, a huge thing for me in addition to digital fasting which is essentially leaving the phone at home and going and walking around the world and just uh 
not having any interruptions and being that weird guy who's not looking at the device at dinner and all that stuff. In addition to that, that's why, or what it's one of the reasons why I'm memorizing now long form text, Sanskrit, etc., is because it gets you away from the machine and then sitting and doing the meditation. And it creates an observation effect where you see so much more of how not only you get lost and you, you know, you mentioned the hypno toad thing, which is a great term for it, but, uh, um, how others are lost in it, you know? And yeah. it's, it's really the matrix kind of stuff, you know, of it's scary. When I see other people in a room, I automatically, so I walk into a room at work and everybody will be on their phones. And even though I want to look at something on my phone while I'm microwaving some food or whatever, I like purposely don't because I don't want to be the guy who's like just that guy who's doing what everybody else is doing. But at the same time, I was like, there's always that compulsive nature. And um, sometimes, you know, I turn my phone off every night. I put it on airplane mode and plug it in so it's not in the bedroom. Um, so I'm not able to be contacted because I figure, you know, even the most important circumstances probably will be pretty finalized by the next day. You know, mm -hmm. anybody way, they'll still be there. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, you know, I don't do that, but it is, it is a scary time because I don't know what the, all the effects are of this. And I really do feel like the fact that we're utilizing memory techniques that have been so proven throughout time to work and open up so many ex so much accessibility to the world around us is so exciting and it's really and we can learn anything about technology you want to learn a program you want to learn how to do anything you can do that through this format but i think it's important that we use some discipline and and get away that's why i have i have uh for writing offline, I have a pencil for a special writing pencil, you know, dedicated writing pencil. Right. I also have a Neo, which is like the old Kindle for writing. doesn't go online. only has two lines of monochrome here so that you're just focused on the output of creativity. And then you spell check and, you know, do everything later. I have around the other corner, I have a cassette recorder right. to record music and not be online or to record thoughts and, and do things. I mean, I've taken some, I'm also active in ham radio, which is an old fashioned technology. One of my goals for this year is Morse code, uh, proficiency and uh, CW on my, uh, you know, telegraph key. So, I mean, I'm, uh, hyper aware of all of these things because I've surrounded myself with them. And space pen is always ready to go right upside down or in negative 200 degrees heat here in a physical journal, physical journal that I've kept uh, every day for over 20 years. So the resistance is alive and well. <laughs> I'm for sure alive over here. Uh, but it's, but I, like I said, you know, today was a rough day of, of like feeling like I was, I'm over, I'm overwhelmed. I'm out of, uh, yeah, I got to chip off. And so when I drove around to run some of my errands, I didn't listen to the radio. I didn't listen to any, there was no talking in the car. It was just me driving like a human being. I like what, uh, uh Louis CK said, can we just stand in line and stand there? Right. That's it. <laughs> human standing in line. Can we do that? But if we're nemnists, then we have to be memorizing something obviously or reciting something. But I'm just saying the point is still the same not to be on our phones and to be uh, hooked into the hypno toad. Right, right. Well, since you mentioned Louis C.K., what's your take on, we talked about dumbing down and that as a problem. What's your take on the like increased sensitivity and offense, being in offense mode that seems to be so prevalent these days? It's got to be exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be exhausting to always be offended. It's like, oh, my gosh. You know, case in point, I was one time – I mean, opinion will come through the story. But uh, one time I I would happen to be next to a guy who I was working with, an older guy. He, We went to another building to have lunch and talk about, you know, whatever was happening with work. And then we walked back to the workplace, and he tripped – his foot caught on a brick, and he fell – and so later on, I had to go back with one of the managers and show, yeah, he fell right here because I was walking with him. 
So they were going to take pictures, you know, for insurance or whatever because he was injured. So a, a co-worker is just taking pictures of the ground, and immediately a guy comes over and goes, what's he doing? Right. And I'm like, <laughs> he's taking pictures. Why? He's a shutter bug. <laughs> and he's like, and walked off all, like, and I was like, what kind of person is this? What kind of person is walking around going like, there's got to be something around here I can find to be, oh, hey, what's this going on? I don't trust it, and I don't understand what you're doing. Right. Uh, I, you know, I just can't wrap my head around the mindset of people who are constantly looking for things to be offended by. I have a bias naturally because I've had more than 20 years in, in uh, comedy, so my tolerance level is fairly high. Extremely high for offensiveness, but at the same time, you know, I, you know, I've recreated myself as a wine and beer expert the last seven years. I haven't been in show business except to do some a few gigs, like in the prisons, etc. And in the last seven years of working in retail stores and restaurants, you know how many complaints I've gotten? Zero, zero. I've gotten zero complaints because of the fact I'm a logical, common sense human being who knows not to step outside the bounds, who knows, understands what people are sensitive about and doesn't ever breach on them. Mm. Yet at the same time, I had, I had previously made a career out of making sure I was provocative, making sure I was pushing the envelope and making sure I was thinking outside the box. Right. So how does one go from 30 years of 27 years of training to be the most outrageous and most over the top and most edgy and then work seven years in your common, you know, grocery store or whatever, and never offend anyone. It's because of the fact I have a brain and I realize where implications lie and how these things go. So I, I, I can't. I, it just must be exhausting. Exhausting. Right. Well, I think that's a, everything all the time. That is I a, cannot begin to uh, approach that level of. Uh, I got stuff to do. I got stuff to memorize, and I'm not looking for reasons to be upset. That is a great way of framing it, and it brings to mind something I memorized not too long ago, which is Proverbs 18.13. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. So, Yes, exactly. <laughs> one thing that's, that's been very important to me, and it's just ironic that I memorized that particular passage, and I was just memorizing it as an example to explain to, to people about memorizing numbers with with text, verbatim text, um, it came in handy immediately because there was a situation where I was ready to answer, but I hadn't, you know, completely listened to what was being said there. And so this is uh, great wisdom. And by memorizing verbatim, we can be wiser people who have, as you say, a brain because the brain that we have is filled with content that that word we exactly. use so so often now content and the quality of the brain is the quality of its content so great point. yeah i think that i think that we and i think we've hit on a lot of uh i mean the real thing is decide what you want to memorize word perfect break it into images put it into locations and just recall and rehearse and thereby you are able to do it, but the most important part of it is doing it and not thinking it or overthinking it or making rules why it won't work or making rules. What was I listening to a while ago when they said uh, – uh, it might have been Jocko Willink on his podcast talking about someone mentioning like any guy who comes to me and says, well, what should I do if I don't want to, if I want to make sure I don't – he's like, no – if you're already coming up with excuses ahead of time, you're you're you you got to move past that. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah, it's good to be always busy and working on things and improving. But what if you know I need a break? Well, if you're the type who's already asking a question, you already haven't even started, and now you want a break. <laughs> there's something to be said for that, and right, I think right. that one of the big lessons of this entire uh, time together tonight is taking action. And then cleaning it up later to make it word perfect yeah. is perfect. Awesome. Well, let's close on that 
wonderful point, and uh, thank you so much for being here. We know there's going to be lots of links down below for the things that we've referred to, and uh, yeah. I really, really appreciate uh, all of this discussion. Thank about you. It's so fun. It's so fun giving forward and then seeing it, you know, come back and then other people giving their ideas and their comments. And it's just so, um, there's so much recirculation and so much, uh, the connectivity in the magnetic memory method family is great. And hearing everybody zipping off of each other when I need help, others are there. And when they need help, I'm here and it's all very reciprocal and, um, it's just exciting. Let's keep going. Awesome. Well, thank you for helping me build this community and can't wait for our next conversation.